In order to um, make responsible research and innovation, RRI, global, there needs to be a global conversation leading, at least in practical terms, to some kind of global consensus, not necessarily on abstract principles, but certainly on concrete practices. So the question is how you can get from the current situation, which is that RRI principles have been developed and quite firmly entrenched in some regions through particular institutions, like the institutions of the European Union, um, but are not necessarily recognized everywhere and may even sometimes be seen to be divisive because they're specifically European, to a situation where uh, common practical principles of action can be globally recognized. Uh, this is a very challenging task, but it's not impossible. It's been achieved in certain areas. Bioethics is a good example. Through the work of UNESCO, um, a universal declaration on bioethics and human rights was adopted in 2005. I think there are some reasonably clear starting points here. One clear starting point is that um, Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights exists. It is universally recognized, at least as text. The question is what to do with it. And that article states very clearly that there is a universal human right to share in the benefits of scientific advancement and its applications. So the question is how to make that real. Starting from that, we also have some quite important shared uh, global visions about the need to avoid abuses of science, abuses of human subjects, uh, abuses due to uh, various kinds of corporate or commercial control of science, or for that matter, uh, due to the secrecy agendas of uh, national security policies. Um, abuses in terms of failure to consult the public about things that directly concern it, something that is important for many public health issues in particular. Um, there may be differences in exactly how these frameworks are applied in different parts of the world. There may be differences in the interpretation of, for instance, what constitutes informed consent for the purposes of human subject research. But there is an already shared conversation around instruments that already exist. The issue is how to build on that to go a bit further than simply avoiding abuses. And in particular, to create a framework that in a more positive sense is actually conducive to equitable participation by all in the scientific process. And that means equitable participation for all scientists. And that isn't currently insured. Science is still driven by a comparatively small number of countries with strong scientific institutions. The number of countries has increased with the emergence of uh, China, Indonesia, Malaysia, and others, Brazil, as major scientific players in global science. But many parts of the world are still left behind. Those parts of the world have share in that human right to participate. And we need institutional efforts to make that right to participate real. Secondly, um, I think we still have considerable deficits in terms of the connection between science and society. Um, citizen engagement in the development of policies that are about science or the application of um, scientific uh, uh, developments, technologies in the broad sense, is um, partial, incomplete, very fragmented. Uh, there is some good practice in various parts of the world, but it really needs to be built on. And for that, there are some real challenges, Ch challenges that have to do with science education, challenges that have to do with the nature of public debate. And we have challenges in terms of institutional design. Many uh, public institutions were designed not to include citizens, but on the contrary, deliberately to exclude them because of the presumption that if you open some things up to democratic debate, you never actually get a result. Um, and examples to do with, say, civil nuclear power or to do with uh, major um, environmental projects or projects with environmental impact like dams and motorways and so on. There is a feeling in many policy circles that if you start including the public in such discussions, you just have 20 years of inconclusive debate. That may be true when the process is not well designed, and of course, when you open it up to public debate, you don't always get the answer you wanted. But at the same time, there is an obligation to ensure that each human being enjoys that human right to benefit from scientific advancement and its applications. So 
globalizing the anti-abuse agenda, to put it very simply, is a challenge that is already partly met. It just needs to be more global and more inclusive. And in addition, we need to build on that negative agenda, which is very valuable, a positive agenda for ensuring universal equitable participation. As a horizon, of course, achieving full universality is likely to be impossible in practice. But aiming towards it and seeking gradually to improve the level of engagement and inclusion is something we can definitely do.